extremely loud and incredibly close. Page 224 to 261. Um, grandmother's chapter where she talks about what happened on the day of 9-11 is fairly straightforward. And there's just one or two things that I want to kind of touch on. If you open up to page 232, um, we get a couple different things that we hadn't, uh, viewpoints we hadn't seen before. So if you remember back to when Oscar was in Hamlet, and he was really embarrassed that his grandmother was laughing at all the, you know, the sad things and crying at all the happy things, the, the humorous things. And now we get that from grandmother's perspective. Oscar, I'm remembering you on stage in front of all those strangers. I wanted to say to them, he's mine. I wanted to stand up and shout, that beautiful person is mine, mine. When I was watching you, I was so proud and so sad. Alas, his lips, your songs. When I looked at you, my life made sense. Even the bad things made sense. They were necessary to make you possible. And this is a good way of, for grandmother to look at her life. You know, when she sees Oscar, everything that's happened to her, and she's had, a, you know, she's had some tough things happen in her life, everything is put into perspective. Because all those bad things were necessary to make this really good thing, which is Oscar, possible. So that's, you know, I think something, another thing you can take from this book that sometimes, you know, your life can start out one way and you can go through some very challenging or difficult times, and then sometimes those things are what make the good times possible and the happiness possible later on in your life. Um, uh, alas, your songs, my parents' lives made sense, my grandparents, even Anna's life. But I knew the truth, and that's why I was so sad. Every moment before this one depends on this one. So at this point, you know, she doesn't know what's happening to her son. Um, she's trying to take care of her grandson. And, you know, then she details what happened at the funeral. Um, on 233, right after the funeral, she comes back to her apartment, and someone had left her a letter. You know, she says she's not interested in reading it right now, but the doorman said he looked desperate. Um, I thought he had to look for what he was looking for, and I realized it no longer existed, nor ever existed. I, would, I thought he would write, or send money, or ask pictures of the baby, if not me. For 40 years, not a word. Only empty envelopes. Okay, so what that means is that she was only getting empty envelopes, and so he wasn't sending all these letters to his unborn son. He was writing them. But just like he couldn't speak and get those ideas and those words out, he couldn't even get the words out on paper. And so he was just sending envelope after envelope after envelope after envelope. Um, and no one saw any of them, except for the one that we know that Oscar's dad did read, the one about the, the firebombing in Dresden. And then, on the day of my son's funeral, two words, I'm sorry, he'd come back. So what happened was Thomas, grandfather, had somehow heard about what happened to his son on 9-11, flew back from Dresden, and left grandmother a note, just saying, I'm sorry. Okay, so grandfather is now back. He left 40 years ago. Grandmother hadn't heard a word from him in all those 40 years, and now he's come back. Going into Oscar's chapter, um, this is a pretty sad chapter, but it gets a little bit of positive things in it. He goes into grandmother's apartment on page 235, and he'd never been in there alone, and he felt kind of uncomfortable, but... He, as a lot of little kids start to do, they start to snoop around. And she opened grandmother's uh, closet, dress, dresser drawer rather. It was filled with envelopes, hundreds of them. They were tied together in bundles. I opened the next drawer down and it was also filled with envelopes. So was the dresser underneath it, all of them were. I saw from the postcards that the date envelopes were organized chronologically, which means by date, and mailed from Dresden, Germany, which is where she said she came from. There's one for every day, from May 31st, 1963, to the worst day. Somewhere addressed to my unborn child, somewhere addressed to my child. Okay, so, grandfather had been sending... Whoa, my face is all over the place on this... There we go, my eyes are back. Um, he'd been sending empty envelopes every day. He'd been writing letters to his son every day, but he hadn't had the courage to send them. Um, going down page 236 a little bit, I heard a sound from one of the other rooms. I quickly closed the drawer so Grandma wouldn't know I was snooping around, and I tiptoed to the front door because I was afraid that maybe what I heard was a burglar. I heard the sound again, and this time I could tell that it was coming from the guest room. I thought, the renter. I thought, he's real. I never loved Grandma more than I loved her right then. And now we know who the renter is. And the renter... I'll let you guess who the renter is. Um... And the renter, actually, you don't even need to guess because it tells you. The renter is grandfather. Okay, he'd come back, and Oscar meets him for the first time. Okay, and um, on page 238, Oscar tells grandfather the story, and he plays the voicemail messages for him. And this is kind of what we've been building towards through the whole book. 
You know, he, he hadn't been able to tell this story to anybody. And then as he's gone around and told this story over and over and over to various blacks that he'd met, he became more comfortable with it and he's starting to move through the grieving process. Um, on page 238, uh, I never needed grandma more than I needed her right then. I asked the renter, can I tell you my story? He opened his left hand, so I put my story into it. I pretended he was grandma, and I started at the very beginning. And he tells grandfather the entire story of what happened with his son's death and all the, the mission that he's gone on and looking for the, the blacks and all these various things. This is what he's needed to do the whole time. Going forward a little bit. Um, page 240, we also get some more examples that Oscar is progressing and moving forward through the grieving process. He's walking around with Abe Black, and he, he visits uh, uh, the Mr. and Mrs. Black, Georgia Black of Staten Island, um, and he sh she shows him, uh, I'm sorry, he shows, uh, she shows him, sorry, um, basically a museum to her husband. And on page 240, um, it had taken us four hours to get to her house. Two of those were because Mr. Black had to convince me to go on the Staten Island Ferry. And if you look at the picture on page 241, you may be too young to remember this, but shortly after 9-11, this ferry boat crashed, and there were a number of people who killed, who were killed. Um, and it looks like, based on the, the fall of Saddam Hussein, that this would have been in the spring of 2003 took place. Um, in addition to the fact that it was obvious potential target, there had also been a ferry accident pretty recently, and in stuff that happened to me, I had pictures of people who had lost their arms and legs. Also, I don't like bodies of water, or boats particularly. Mr. Black asked me how I would feel in bed that night if I didn't get on the ferry. I told him, heavy boots probably, and how will you feel if you did? Like $100? So, so what if, what about while I'm on the ferry? What if it sinks? What if someone pushes me in? What if it's hit by a shoulder-filed missile? There won't be a tonight, tonight. He said, in which case, he won't feel anything anyway. I thought about that. So you've seen various instances where Oscar has been brave enough to do things like ride an elevator and eat food which is not individually wrapped or prepared by his mother, riding on public transportation, and now riding on the ferry bridge. Um, and when they get there, you know, they get this museum. And Oscar gets really sad on page 242. I started to get heavy boots for obvious reasons, like where are all her things? Where were her shoes and her diploma? What about shadows of her flowers? I made a decision that I wouldn't ask about the key because I wanted her to believe that we had come to see her museum, and I think Mr. Black had the same idea. Going on down the page a little bit, um, my husband, she said, almost like he was another exhibit in, the, in his life. The four of us stood there smiling at one another, and then the man said, well, I suppose you'd like to see my museum now. I told him, we just did, it was really great. He said, no, Oscar, that's her museum. Mine's in the other room. Okay, so this is we get an instance of people celebrating life while they have their loved ones around them. And they want to have as much of their life around them as they possibly can. Oscar, initially, when he saw the museum, assumed that her husband had passed away, and she was just kind of living in the past and reliving all the memories with him. But actually, she was celebrating his life while he was still alive, and he was doing the same thing for her. Another positive example for Oscar. Um, on page 245, um, 246, we get another example of Oscar doing something he was terrified to do, go up on top of the Empire State Building, which, you know, considering his dad was killed on 9-11 in a very big, tall tower, is a pretty brave thing for him to do. Um, and on page 245, we get a good quote, um, that, another good quote you can take from this. I thought about all the things that everyone ever says to each other, and how everyone is going to die, whether it's in a millisecond, or days, or months, or 76.5 years if you were just born. Everything that's born has to die, which means our lives are like skyscrapers. The smoke rises at different speeds, but they're all on fire, and, they're, and we're all trapped. So I just think is a good quote. They meet uh, Ruth Black, and Ruth Black is another character who is completely trapped. And again, this is kind of an unrealistic example, kind of like Thomas who can't speak, um, and various other characters who are a little bit over the top. But this woman has been so trapped by grief that she hasn't left the top of the Empire State Building. She doesn't want to deal with it, so she just stays up there. Um, and on page 252, this is where she explains what happened. Um, her husband, while he was working, would shine a bright light up so he could, she could see him on top of the building. She said, I felt just like a queen. When the light went off, I knew his day was over, and I'd go home and down and meet him at home. When he died, I came back up here. It's silly. No, it isn't, I said. I wasn't looking for him. I'm not a girl, but it gave me the same feeling that it had when it was daytime, and I was looking for his light. I knew it was there. I just couldn't see it. Mr. Black took a step toward her. I couldn't bear to go home, she said. I asked why not, even though I was afraid I was going to learn something I didn't want to know. 
She said, because I knew he wouldn't be there. Mr. Black told her, thank you, but she wasn't done. I curled up in the corner that night, that corner over there, and fell asleep. Maybe I wanted the guards to notice me. I don't know. When I woke up in the middle of the night, I was all alone. It was cold. I was scared. I walked to the railing. Right there, I'd never felt more alone. And this is another example of someone who can't move past their grief. And so she is literally trapped on top of the building, just like Thomas is trapped within his life and various other characters who are trapped who can't move forward and can't talk about it. Um, a Black tries to put the moves on Abby, uh, sorry, not on Abby Black, but on uh, Ruth Black and asked her out if he could hang out with her. And right after that, A Black says he's done and Oscar is alone again. Um, going on a little bit, right at the very end of this chapter, Oscar's laying in bed and he's imagining and he's inventing and he's inventing and he's inventing and he's inventing and, he's inventing and he finally comes up with the idea. And then a thought came to me into my brain that wasn't like the other thoughts. It was closer to me and louder. I didn't know where it came from or what it meant or if I loved it or hated it. It opened up like a fist or a flower. What about digging up Dad's empty coffin? And then you can see, just like Grandfather does, he is imagining yes and no and trying to come to a conclusion on this. Okay, now, the next chapter you're going to read for tomorrow um, starts on page 262, and it's a relatively short chapter, and it's on page 284. The words do get smaller, okay? And also, uh, just to put this out there for you, um, on page 2... Uh, 276, there is a sex scene between grandmother and grandfather. If this makes you uncomfortable and you'd rather not read it, you may skip that page um, and probably get through the scene, but just to put that out there for you. So one thing you can think about as you're reading this is why do the words keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller? What's the point of that? And you'll just read till you can't read anymore. There will get to a point where the words get to be too small and you can't read anymore. Okay? And seniors, this is where you're going to finish and Unfortunately, it's a pretty bad spot to finish. So, if you're, you know, as a reminder, you, uh, your test is on Friday. And if you're interested in continuing and finishing up the book over the weekend, you're certainly welcome to. Just let me know on Friday. And that's it. Uh, tomorrow, you will be receiving your book with all the letters from all your classmates that you've read. And that's about it. High five.